I'm always amazed at how the Holy Spirit puts together a service, how he puts together a theme. Uh, none of us, and we've all said this time and time again, uh, ever talk to each other relative to the music or the message. We just let the Lord lead and guide, and then we put things together. And uh, I know that God has a desire to encourage you in a certain way tonight. You'll understand when I tell you this. Please open your Bibles to the book of Job. Job chapter 14. Job chapter 14. What they just sang is what I'm going to preach to you for the next 45 minutes or 30 minutes or 10 minutes, however the Lord leads. Because going through difficulties is something that we all do. And one of the things that we, come, that we need to come to understand is that bad things happen to good people. Okay, over here. Bad things can happen to good people. But I have to tell you before we start tonight that if you're a child of God, God is always in control. He's always in control. Look at Job 14. We'll read more than I need to, but I want to get the context of the, of the action. Job 14, verse 1. Job is responding, and we'll talk about what he's responding to in a moment. Man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. And dost thou open thine eyes upon such a one and bringest me into judgment with thee? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean, not one? Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. Turn from him that he may rest till he shall accomplish as a hireling his day. For there, here's where we're headed, is hope of a tree. If it be cut down, that it will sprout again and that the tender branch thereof will not cease, though the root thereof was old in the earth and the stock thereof die in the ground. Yet, through the scent of water, underline that in the scriptures, yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth bows like a plant, but man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? You know the story of Job. I hope that you're acquainted with it. Job is that book we get to in our reading, in our progressive reading, and we read fast. Because generally the Lord teaches us uh, and, and deals with us about what we're reading. And none of us necessarily like the content of the book of Job, but it's there as really the oldest book of the Bible. Because humanity and what we go through as believers and as Christians is hard to understand. It's hard to grasp sometimes. Difficulties come and the storms come and the trials come and they can at times blow us away. They seem unfair. And while Job, I mean, my goodness, we'll talk about it in a moment, Job was resilient. He resisted, but yet we see in the book as we read through the content of it that Job is disturbed. Job is upset. Job is not understanding. Job doesn't know where God really wants to take him until he has an encounter with God near the end of the book. And so often the same is true for us. But I came tonight to tell you that as you travel through those dark times, as you Maneuver through the storms that you will experience as a believer because God chastens those that he loves. He does what's best for us even though we don't necessarily like the journey or the course that he chooses. And he knows exactly what we need. But as we travel, I want to encourage you tonight, as we travel through those difficulties, whatever you do, understand that it's not time to give up. Understand it's not time to quit. It's not time to throw in the towel. Even if you can't see what God is doing, believe that God is doing something on your behalf. 
I want you to know there's always hope for the believer. That's the title of my message tonight, Hope for the Believer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the opportunity that we have to minister your word. Father, there's people in this audience and people by television that are traveling through a difficulty that they have found hard to understand. I pray that tonight you would open up their heart and open up their eyes. Lord, maybe not to all the answers, but to the route by which they might travel through those things that they're experiencing. Father, let the ministry of the Holy Spirit take place upon my person and upon those that listen. We need you desperately, and we ask it all in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen and amen. If you have ever read the book of Job, you've ever studied at any point of time, I want you to go back and carefully look over chapters 1 and 2, uh, and primarily chapter 1 as it sets the scene of the book of Job, and learn a little bit about Job. As we study Job, as we look at uh, Job and his character and his life, uh, I'm amazed that there are some in the body of Christ that would actually try to tell us or try to teach us that what happened with Job was Job's fault, that Job had sinned or feared or had gone in a wrong direction, and uh, the, the result of that was that the hedge around him was lowered. Nothing could be further than the truth because there's nothing that can actually take apart or lower or remove a hedge that is around about those of us that are in covenant with God except God himself. Satan is our adversary, and I like Tara's song. I've got her message now on the bottom of my shoe. If you weren't here in church this morning, you won't understand that. But I got news for the devil. He's not in charge. He's not overwhelming God. To be honest with you, uh, God is too great to have an adversary. Do you understand that? He has no adversary. There's no one God's equal. There's no one that can arm wrestle him. There's no one that can take him to the carpet. There's no one that can outthink him. There's no one that can outmaneuver him. There's no one that is greater than our God, the God of all creation, the God of, of, of earth, sea, sky, and heaven, all that in them is, the God that made the plan of redemption and brought us into a covenant with his son through the death of his son at Calvary. And now that God lives within our very being and leads us and guides us, I tell you, nothing happens outside of God's purpose in our lives. Now, there can be things that we do that create a problem. I agree with that. But at the same point in time, if we read the book of Job carefully, you'll find that Job had not uh, done something wrong. In fact, the conversation between uh, God and Satan ran similarly in the first two chapters. In Job 1.1, listen, he said, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect... Number two, he was upright. Number three, he feared God and he eschewed evil. And so Satan, and again, here's evidence that he is not God's adversary. He's your adversary, he's mine, but he's not God's adversary. God calls for him to show up and he has to show up. He says, what have you been doing? I've been traveling around the earth seeing who I can make miserable. That's the Larson paraphrase. And God said to him, have you considered... Have you looked at, do you know God looks at you with great faith? Do you know that if he's allowed a great problem to come your way, it's because he knows that he's given you the capacity to travel through it? And he has faith in you to take advantage of what he has supplied and what he has provided? And so he looks at Satan, he says, hey, hey have you considered who's on my team? Do you know who's standing with me? Do you know about my servant Job? Can you put your name there tonight? Are you standing with Christ? Are you standing as a Christian? Are you standing as a believer? Are you going forward with everything that was within you to promote Christ around the world, allow Christ to be what he needs to be in your life? Are you? Will God stand up today as Satan says, oh, well, I know him, I know him with that 
er in his face and an er in his voice because God's got a hedge around him. But God says, have you considered my servant Job that he, that he is perfect, upright, fears God, and eschews evil? And even after Satan got a chance to hit him the first time, in Job chapter 2 and verse 3, the Bible says back to Satan again, have you considered my servant? He is perfect, upright, fears God, and hates evil. So even after the first attacks, Job was still considered as the testimony of God as perfect, upright, fears God, and hated evil. So what happened to Job was not a result of something Job did. It was really actually God looking at Job and said, there's a man I can trust to go through something. Are you going through something? Are you traveling through a difficulty? Are you trying to figure it out? Has it about thrown you over? I want you to know tonight, then, if that's the case, and you're a born-again believer, especially a born-again, spirit-filled believer, God has equipped you to travel through whatever it is you're looking at. Whatever it is you're facing is not just some random circumstance that happened to blow in on the last wind. It's not. It's something that God is doing. It's something that God has allowed. It's something that God wants to move into our lives and through our lives in a, in a, in a positive, wonderful way. But you and I have got to continue. Listen now, here's where I'm headed. The, you and I have got to continue to believe despite what we see, despite what we feel, despite what we comprehend, and certainly despite the messages that sit on our shoulder and scream into our ear how we should leave, how we should quit, how we should back off, how we should move away from what God has given us. Let me tell you something. There's nothing more important than the pathway of the believer being fulfilled as God designs it. We don't choose our course. God, help us to finish our course with joy. No matter what we encounter, no matter what we face, this race that we run, the course is designed by God. We run it, but he designs the course. you got to believe that. And when I tell you that God's in charge, then that means whatever happens as you travel through this harsh land, a harsh time, or a, a dark period that you don't understand, God is still right there with you. And he's going to teach us some things. So Job did not cause the problems. And you know the story how in one day he loses his wealth and his children. And then after Satan's second visitation to heaven, God even allows Job to be smitten. His body stricken, sores. It's one thing to lose everything. I, my, three of my four kids standing here tonight before I preach singing, I, I can't imagine 10 funerals. I don't even want to comprehend it. How would you pick yourself up from that? But Job said, I came in with nothing and I'm leaving with nothing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What kind of man can do that? What kind of man can do that? I can tell you, a man who has an, a relationship with a living God, a man who is secure in that, but even the things that he was secure in as he travels through this trial start to be blown away. It seems like everybody and everything is against him. And I know, I know that we, we attack his wife, but listen, they were her kids too. They were her children too. She gave birth to them. She walked them. She weaned them. She changed them. And to see them leave, I'm sure, and to see them go the way that they went was more devastating. I'm, I'm a tough guy, but look, when it comes to my children, I'm, 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 I'm irritated when they're irritated. But when it comes to their mom, if you irritate them, you're dead. 
in Jesus' name. Because moms have that grizzly bear attitude about their kids. Come on, somebody. They've got that grizzly, and, 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 and so let's not be too harsh on Job's wife. She doesn't get it. She doesn't know. How could you get it? Only be overwhelmed, not so much with the loss of the prestige and the finances in a single hour, but the children. She tells him, curse God and die. And then his three buddies come. Now, you've got to get the picture of Job. He's a, the Bible says he's the greatest man that existed uh, in the, is it the East? Yeah, the greatest man in the East. And, and, and that means that he had great wealth. So his buddies are not going to be ditch diggers. They're going to be wealthy people too. Okay, I, I mean, I don't hang out with multimillionaires because I'm, I'm not one. I don't think you're hanging out with multimillionaires either because we kind of gravitate to people that are more whatever we are. I, I'm, 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 it's not a sin. It's just common sense. And, and rich people will correspond and talk with rich people because they have so much in common. And what we find out about Job's friends and Job is that there was a common theme, a common theology, a common thought process, and the theology was this. Rich is blessed of God, and poor and, and, and down there is somebody that did something wrong. It was everyday theology. It even existed even in the days of Jesus and his disciples. And, and they thought, because Jesus told them that it's harder for a rich man to get to heaven than a camel to pass through the eye of the needle. And, uh, and his disciples went, oh, who could be saved then? Because rich was blessed and poor was not blessed. And if you had a lot, it was because you were good and you did well and it, good things happened to good people. And it must have been Job's theology too because in chapter 6 when they start talking to him, I mean these friends come and start talking to him, uh, they did really well for the first seven days. They just practiced their shut-ups in a corner. But when they started talking to him, they started acting out this everyday theology that they believed in, that they probably sat together and talked about because they tell Job, they said, now we know and you know that good people have good things, bad people get whopped by the Lord. So good people don't get whopped by the Lord. And you've sat right here with us and said so yourself. And now that it's come to you, you don't want to say that it was your fault. Let me tell you something. Before you climb on the good things that only happen to good people bandwagon and start attacking people that are going through something, you better be careful because you don't know what God is trying to accomplish in that saint of God. We don't know why we have to go through things or certain people do. And certainly, I agree, yes, sometimes we cause it. Sin and uh, the wrong action, the wrong attitude causes problems. But every now and then, God just moves in a certain way with a certain person, and it doesn't really make sense. It doesn't look like normal, and we wonder what's going on. Well, they must be some kind of sinner for God to do that to them. It wasn't so. God was doing something powerful in Job. He was going to do something wonderful in Job. He was going to do something that Job didn't understand. Let me tell you, when you go through a trial, you're going to learn what you don't know about God. And you're going to learn what you don't know about yourself. And your God is going to want to show you some things. So listen, it's more important to God than to give, as Grace sang tonight, as the kids sang tonight, that comfortable, warm, fuzzy, whoop, I like that. Who doesn't? I do. But God knows that if I don't go through what I'm facing right now, then I'll never get to the place spiritually that I need to be. I'll never be equipped to be the man or the woman that God has designed for me. And there's a course and there's a situation and just right ahead where I'm going to need the tools that I pick up in the middle of this hurtful, harmful, wondering what is God doing situation. I'm going to need what I learned there. I'm going to learn about God and I'm going to learn about myself. We're not as hot as we think we are. Let me preach it over here. We're not as hot as we think we are. 
The heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? And sometimes the things that God needs to, uh, uh, to, to draw out of us, to reveal to us about ourselves, can only be done in a knockdown. Because our pride won't allow it to happen as we travel in the good things happen to good people. I'm a good person. I go to church. I do everything right. And God says, I'm glad. And I know that you're in covenant with me. And I, but I need to do something so that I can take you a little deeper, so that I can teach you a little more about myself and teach you a little bit more about yourself. We all have to learn the same lesson, my friend, and the lesson is not to count on us, but to count on him. I guarantee you that we go through things primarily because we're still counting on the wrong thing and not counting on God. Oh, it's... <laughs> listen... When everything is good and the bank account is high and the job is wonderful and everybody's patting you on the back and saying, aren't you just wonderful and isn't it just beautiful and woohoo, we don't learn a thing. And the problem is every now and then, most of the time, we start believing the mail we're getting. Preachers, you're all hiding back there. What was What is the, God has to expose us to ourselves. And as much as you may know about God, there's some things you don't know. I sat here again and, and listened to Brother Swigert Wednesday night this week, 1988, going through a difficult time, and God tells him, I'm going to show you something you don't know about the Holy Spirit. And the benefit of that particular situation that you and I are now experiencing are because he went through that. And he didn't quit. He said, I don't know where the answer is and I don't know what it is, but I know it's in this book. And I'll seek God till I find it. Until I understand more about God than I know now, and I understand more about myself than I know now. Welcome to Christianity. And the world looked at it and said, Oh, we don't understand it. We don't, oh, no, it couldn't. No, no, no. And, and the questions flew and the insults flew. But God was doing something doing something uniquely special. We're here tonight with a message that will help transform this world in the last few hours of its existence before the return of Christ because of what that man went through. And if you don't understand that, now listen to me. We've got to take what we're learning through the time of trial and let God build that into us. Let him move in us. But right now, I just want you to understand that God is doing something in your life, and it's not something that you need to be ashamed of, but it is something you need to get through. It is something you need to face right, because the one thing that will get you through, and then the only thing that will get you through is faith and faith in the right object. God is pleased with but one thing. He's not pleased with your work. He's not pleased with your effort. He's not overwhelmingly pleased with all the things we think he is. He is pleased with our faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. The trial's not about your kids or your money or your job or your ministry. Brother Dale said it so well. The trial is about your faith. Satan is out to get your faith. He wants to destroy you as God. God is about to add to you. And if you buy into the idea that God has forgotten you, you buy into the idea that God hasn't thought about you, you buy into the idea that God is just throwing you away, or maybe you did something wrong and God is now eliminating you, then you will drop out of what God wants you to get. God can build endurance in us. God can correct us in trials. He chastises those he loves. The Bible says that tribulation worketh Oh, that dirty word, patience. 
Patience is endurance in circumstances. You need to know how to get through something. So he puts on, on you something that it feels like you can't bear. But 1 Corinthians 10 and 13 says that God has not given us anything that we, he's faithful and he'll not put upon us anything else or anything more than we can bear. I'm paraphrasing it poor, but this is what the promise of God is. So if God has said, I won't put on you anything more than you can bear, who are we to say, yes, you do? It can feel like that. It's okay to say amen there. Because when the children die and the house is wrecked and the wife is cursing you and the, the friends that you thought you had that you shared theology with, that you shared ministry with, that you thought were in your corner come and start downgrading you and they even say, well, your kids were sinners. That's why they died. You read the book, that's how they go. Job starts, whoa. He has questions. But I tell you what saves Job, <laughs> what saves Job is what I call faith flashes. This is why faith is so important to keep alive. Faith. Out of somewhere, as we read through the text, you're going to find that Job is arguing with his friends. He even says, God, I wish, I, I wish my words were written down in a book. He got his wish. He said, I wish, and he was really talking about defending himself, that he hadn't done wrong, that he didn't understand, and he would like to have a jury trial with the Lord. Don't ask for that. You might get it. But even through that, we see the true character of Job and the true heart of Job because right in the middle of all of this confusion and all of this hurt, all of a sudden, and I know it's old covenant, but I'm going there anyway, he has a move of the Holy Ghost. Listen, I'm, I'm, here's where I'm going. To get through this that you're going through, you need to have a move of the Holy Ghost. To get through what you're going through, you need to have a, the Holy Spirit moving in your heart. You need a, you need a, a, you need a inner, you need a, you need a, you need an encounter with the power of God. And Job is going through all of this, and all of a sudden in Job 13, 15, he looks up at his, uh, his accusers and say, wait a minute, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me. See, what's that? That's faith rising up on the inside of you. That's something coming alive on the inside of you. That's something moving in you that's not from you, that's not from your brain. It didn't come from your uh, mental acumen or your education. It comes from God. And in the new covenant, believer lives on the inside of you. Shame on you, spirit-filled believer, if you're not encountering the option of the move of God in a time of your trial. Wait on it. Look for it. It'll come if you have faith that Jesus died to provide you with it. It won't solve your initial problem, but right in the middle of your issue, about the time you're trying to quit, there's something on the inside of you that'll say, though he slay me, I'm still going to trust him. He goes a little bit further on, and in verse, or chapter 19, he all of a sudden steps up and gives us eschatology. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that I, I'll stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. What's that? That's faith. That's faith. That's faith that won't quit. It's, it's, it's faith. And in Job 23, ultimately he says, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. But meanwhile, the tree is cut down. It's withering away. Going down to almost nothing. It's no longer the flourishing tree that everyone saw and sat under and relished in. Is your life like that today? Have you gone through that situation that cuts all the branches off of your existing trunk and even the trunk has been cut down and, man, you, you, you're down. 
See, you're down. And you got, you're nothing but a stump of your former self. Cut way down. And the devil's jumping on your back and religion is jumping on your back. You even jumped on your own back. But all of a sudden, on the inside, something that can't be denied, something that can't be crushed, something that can't be smothered starts to rise up in you. All of a sudden, there's this... Wait a minute. I'm not done yet. He's not done with me. I may not understand it. What is that? That's the scent that you're catching of water. What's water? It's a move of the Holy Ghost. You don't need much. I said you don't need much, but you need a move of the Holy Ghost. I'm glad I'm in a Pentecostal church. I'm glad we expect to believe that the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit is going to find some stumps in the congregation, find some stumps over television, those that have been battered down and beaten down and don't think they're going to get up. I say to you there's something on the inside of you that'll rise up in face of opposition and say yet though he slay me you can't kill us you can't eliminate us because on the inside of this blood bought war God is working and living and all I need all I need is one move just the scent I'm hurrying here just the scent of water and in the middle of my trial in the middle of my hurt I'll stand and look at my enemies who are accusing me and say something like you wonder why I'm smiling through the thunder you wonder glory you wonder why I can smile tonight because I've caught a scent of water I've caught a scent of the Holy Ghost. I've got a scent of the Holy Ghost. I wonder why I'm smiling through the thunder. Wonder why my soul feels no alarm. There's an unseen hand guiding my vessel. He's my harbor in the midst of my storm. Hallelujah. Come on. He's in you. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? He didn't leave you. He hasn't deserted you. He's on the inside of you. You don't need to give up. You just need a move of the Holy Ghost. You need just a moment in the presence of the Lord. You need your faith in Christ and him crucified to be secured. Well, you wonder why I'm smiling at the thunder. Oh, yes, Lord. Well, you wonder why my soul feels no alarm. Ah, there's an unseen hand guiding, guiding, guiding my vessel. He's my harbor. I said he's my harbor. I got a harbor in the time of my storm. Hey, 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 hey. You just need a move of the Holy Ghost. You just need a touch from the Holy Ghost. You just need a scent of the water. You just need a touch. Well, Jesus is with me when the storm clouds gather. He's standing by my side when I hear the thunder roll. He holds my hand. I said he holds my hand when I begin to tremble. When the winds of this world is blowing strong. Hallelujah. You need a song down in your spirit. You need a move of the Holy Ghost. A move of the Holy Ghost. You can't educate this. You can't do it 
anything for it. You don't earn it, but you believe. Jesus is with me when the storm clouds gather. He's standing by my side when I hear the thunder roll. He holds my hand when I begin to tremble. When the winds of this world grow strong. what you got to have. That's a Pentecostal move of the Holy Ghost. and exhibit faith in Jesus and what he's ready to do for you. You may not understand it all, but if you hold to his hand, he'll take you all the way through. just trying to hype the people. This ain't no hype. Come Holy on. Ghost living is no hype. Come on. Jesus living on the inside of you. I don't have to hype you. Come I just on. have to remind you. I just have to cause you to remember that in the middle of your difficulty, Jesus is You're with me when the storm clouds gather. He's standing by my side when I hear the thunder roll. Jesus is with me. 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 Jesus
Yes, 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 yes. With me when the storm clouds gather, we stand in by my side. I hear the thunder roll, and he holds my hand. When I begin to tremble, the winds of this world is blowing strong. Jesus, Jesus is with me when the storm. smell the water. I said I can smell the water. There is the sound of an abundance of rain. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is about ready. One more time. Jesus with me when the storm clouds gather. He's standing by my side. Stop. 